Uh, welcome to the second lecture of 2021 and the 22nd lecture of the Asha Ganga Jamni joint endeavor. With this lecture, we start a new series, the Medieval Indian Society. In this series, spread over six lectures, we deal with aristocracy to the peasants. Today, we start with a lecture on a personality who was an important member of the Mughal aristocracy. Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan is not, uh, 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 not only belonged to the elite class, but was also the one who maintained a household with karkhanas which rivaled its imperial counterparts. After his father's death, Abdul Rahim was adopted by Akbar, who married the widow of Rahim's father. His karkhana included scribes, artists, painters, calligraphers, scholars, poets, and others. His Masir Rahimi is an important source for the Mughals and the society which existed under them. He was himself a scholar and poet par excellence. The Dohas of Rahim are repeated till date. Today, there is yet another significance attached to this topic. Very recently, his tomb, which had been in a very dilapidated condition, has been renovated and rehabilitated by the Aga Khan Trust for Culture under the guidance of its project director, Mr. Ratish Tanda. The almost naked structure of the tomb was restored and is now open to the in view of much criticism which came their way for the work which they did at Humayun's tomb, care has been taken in the restoration of this building to leave patches of the original intact. Though at the original plaster has again been callously removed. But on this, some other day. But thank you, Aga Khan Trust for Culture, for a positive change in your approach. As I said, we have with us a very senior bureaucrat and author, Mr. T. C. A. Raghavan, who is to speak to us about Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan, a quintessential Mughal noble and aristocrat. Dr. Raghavan is a former Indian diplomat who was a 1982 batch officer of the Indian Foreign Service. As a diplomat, he served as Joint Secretary of the Division of Ministry of External Affairs in Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iran, PAI Division. Between 2013 and 15, he was the Indian High Commissioner posted in Pakistan. Just now before the show, he was telling us that in Pakistan, he represented India for around seven years or so. Dr. Raghavan, apart from being a diplomat, is also a trained student of history. He was awarded a PhD by the Jawaharlal Nehru in 1992 for his dissertation on the agrarian history of the Narmada Valley. After retirement, he wrote a very well-received book, which probably most of you, if not have read, must have heard about, Attendant Lords, Bairam Khan and Abdul Rahim, Courtiers and Poets in Mughal India. It's a remarkable book. It was published by Harper Collins in 2017 and was awarded the Muhammad Habib Prize 
for Medieval Indian History, the best book of Medieval Indian History by the Indian History Congress in December 2017. Just as an aside, Dr. Raghavan, my book also received the same award in 2014. His second book is also published by Harper Collins and is entitled The People Next Door, The Curious History of India's Relations with Pakistan. Welcome, Dr. Raghavan, to Thank our you. program. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Razavi, and thank you very much also to Asha and to uh, Ganga Jamna for having invited me to this uh, platform. And I'm very honored to be talking in this particular program because I know what a great galaxy of scholars has spoken uh, in this, and I'm sure will continue to uh, speak in this. But, but more than anything else, uh, uh, Dr. Razavi, I would like to congratulate you for the skill and the great knowledge and patience with which you have anchored these programs. I've had an occasion to see uh, uh, some of them. Uh, and I do hope you will continue with this platform, even when the pandemic situation uh, improves, because I think as a pedagogic uh, tool, uh, it has immense uh, value uh, to get uh, the best scholars in a particular uh, subject and then to let them speak before an audience, which is a mixed kind of audience, I think it has its great uh, advantage. And from the flavor of the discussions that have followed these lectures, uh, it's possible to see how much of an advance uh, technology enables us uh, in uh, the endeavor of dissemination of uh, knowledge and scholarship, uh, and more important, uh, rigorous knowledge and rigorous uh, scholarship. So thank you very much for having invited me. Uh, I'm very happy to have a chance to speak about uh, uh, Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan. Uh, it's a figure, he's a figure who has fascinated me for many years. And although I was never formally a student of uh, Mughal history or a medieval Indian history, uh, in exploring his personality, uh, I, uh, I tried to uh, educate myself and familiarize myself with the nuances of our medieval uh, past. So uh, we, of course, know Mughal history uh, primarily through the prism of the emperors. Uh, and that, of course, is a very compelling uh, uh, story because if you if you look at uh, the grand uh, uh, panorama of Mughal history, uh, uh, beginning with uh, Babur's uh, tomb in uh, in Kabul, uh, in uh, Humayu's tomb in uh, in uh, Delhi, uh, uh, Akbar in Sikandra, Jahangir in Lahore, uh, and coming down in the end uh, to uh, uh, Aurangzeb in Khuldabad. Uh, and finally, as compared to the grand structures of the first four or five great Mughals, you have uh, the rest of the Mughals in Nizamuddin in small, uh, somewhat uh, uh, not very distinguished uh, or uh, very important uh, graves. So that that it's a very, very compelling story uh, when you view it through the prism of the emperors. But sometimes I think we should also pay much more attention to the Mughal uh, nobility and the aristocracy, uh, uh, and because that also provides a different perspective on the uh, on the empire, on the Mughals, on the culture of the Mughals, uh, and as I said, the, the personality of uh, Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan uh, enabled me to get a certain insight uh, into that particular society and uh, history. Uh, if one uh, uh, sees uh, our medieval history, you will find many such compelling uh, figures. There is Bairam Khan, Abdul Rahim's father, Abdul Rahim, of course, but you also have figures such as uh, uh, Mir Jumla, uh, Mahaji Sindhya, uh, and many others. Uh, uh, Mir Jumla, for instance, uh, I know there was a very, very well uh, written biography of him some 50, 60 years uh, ago by a student of Jadunath uh, Sarkar, but really the drama of his life, beginning from Persia, then in uh, uh, then in Deccan and finally ending up in Bengal and Assam, uh, it's a it's a fascinating story uh, about of of great enterprise, great courage, great political 
uh, qualities uh, and so on. And there are many others, many other persons uh, like this. Mahaji Sindhya, the leader of the Marathas, is another such uh, person. And I do hope at some stage someone writes a biography uh, of him. Uh, there are other figures also. If I could see, uh, if I could go to the slides, uh, please. Uh, we have the figure of, uh, uh, I've already mentioned Meet Jumla and, uh, can you see the slides? Yes, so you have uh, Meet Jumla and then, uh, the next one, please. Mirza Raja Jai Singh. Now, Jai Singh, again, such a uh, such an arresting figure uh, in Aurangzeb's reign. A great soldier, a great diplomat. Uh, 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 if you see diplomacy or medieval diplomacy through uh, Jai Singh, you get a wonderful perspective of how uh, a very, very difficult work of diplomacy, which is trying to bring two uh, somewhat irreconcilable entities like Shivaji and Aurangzeb uh, together, and how the application of military force combined with uh, diplomatic skill made him almost successful. In the end, uh, that endeavor failed when the meeting between uh, Aurangzeb and Shivaji uh, ended uh, disastrously. But as a diplomatic exercise, uh, it was a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful uh, achievement, uh, which of course ended in failure and tragically, as Jai Singh's uh, life story shows, somewhat tragically uh, for him. But you also have, uh, after the next slide, please, uh, Durgadas Rathor, uh, another very compelling uh, figure of medieval history in Aurangzeb's reign and qualities of. Uh, of loyalty, of fidelity, great personal uh, courage, enterprise, all of these come through in him very clearly, but also an insight into understanding how, uh, what was the nature of the Rajput relationship with the, with the Mughals and how that relationship changed uh, between, uh, from Akbar to Jahangir to Shah Jahan to uh, Aurangzeb and what happened to it uh, uh, thereafter. Uh, uh, in Sita Mal, for instance, in central India, there's a small princely Rathor state. Sita Mal was a small princely state. And the, and the ruler of that was an accomplished historian himself, Raghubir Singh. And he wrote a biography of one of his uh, ancestors, uh, Ratan Singh uh, Rathor. Ratan Singh is incidentally the person after whom Ratlam is uh, Named. But Ratan Singh served for many years in the Deccan in Aurangzeb's uh, armies. And if you view Aurangzeb's reign through uh, Ratan Singh's uh, uh, prism, you get a wonderful perspective into the nature of uh, Mughal, of the Mughal presence in the Deccan, the difficulties which these Rajput uh, contingents had over there, because on the one hand, they had to manage their small estates and kingdoms far away. At the same time, they had to keep a military unit in preparedness uh, for engaging with the Marathas and so on. So my brief point is that viewing uh, viewing uh, medieval our medieval history through many of these uh, characters will enable us to get a wonderfully new, uh, fresh perspective, uh, apart from that which is given to us by the emperors themselves. So in that perspective, Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan and his father, Vairam Khan, uh, the next slide, please, uh, is a useful way of uh, approaching uh, uh, our medieval history. So Mahaji Sindhya had already referred to the next slide, please. So Bairam Khan, I'll briefly touch on him. Bairam Khan was Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan's uh, father. Uh, he himself came from a family which is which was well known in its time in 14th and 15th century Persia and Central Asia. But because the family didn't do too well, you finally find Bairam Khan's uh, uh, father and grandfather joining the service of the Mughals. And uh, Bairam Khan himself, uh, as part of uh, Baba's court in Kabul, uh, he came down with uh, 
came down with the Mughal armies, uh, participated in the first battle of uh, Panipat, was present when uh, 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 was part of that court when Humayu, when Babur died, Humayu becomes emperor. But in all this, although he was known for coming from a good family, uh, was uh, a young man of uh, promise, he did not really play any major role. Bairam Khan really comes into his own uh, after Humayu faces a string of defeats from a resurgent uh, uh, Afghan, uh, resurgent Afghan reaction to the Mughal uh, victories uh, led by uh, Sher Khan. Uh, and uh, so Humayu is defeated decisively in a number of battles. His brother turns uh, uh, against him and he suddenly finds he's without prospects. He's driven out of Delhi. He can't go to Lahore because one of his brothers will not let him in. Similarly, he can't go to uh, Kabul. And he's trying very hard to see what he can do when Bairam Khan appears on the scene uh, and assumes a position of great authority. Now, I've got this slide because it's interesting. Uh, not many people notice it when they go to Humayu's tomb. But there is a tomb of Isa Khan uh, just adjoining Humayu's tomb in Delhi. And it's a beautiful uh, garden uh, tomb. Uh, Isa Khan was one of those. He was an important noble in Sher Khan's uh, 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 contingent. And he tried very hard to get Bairam Khan to leave the Mughals uh, and join up with uh, Sher Khan. And Bairam Khan uh, decided against it and moved on to uh, try to link up with uh, with Humayu. He heard Humayu was in Sindh, so he tried to make his way, way to Sindh through Gujarat, where he was helped by another person. Isa Khan helped him. Isa Khan, in fact, made sure that Bairam Khan was not put to death. But through, he made his way to Gujarat. And there again, he, he is helped by a Sufi, uh, a Sufi, uh, a Sufi of some station at the time, Sheikh Gadai. May I have the next slide? And uh, Sheikh Gadai is uh, the son of uh, uh, a Sheikh Jamali Kambo, you know, who's, uh, there's the very famous Jamali Kamali uh, tomb and mosque in uh, Mehroli. So Sheikh Gadai was uh, Sheikh Jamali's uh, son. And I only uh, put these two slides to relate Bairam Khan to structures we are otherwise familiar with, but don't necessarily associate with his uh, life uh, story. But Bairam Khan finally joins up with uh, Humayu in uh, Sindh, when Humayu is really uh, with his back to the wall. Uh, he has with him possibly at that time, not more than 60 or 70 uh, followers. Most of his important uh, nobles have abandoned him. His brothers, as I said, have already uh, turned against him. And he was wondering what to do, whether he should go on the Hajj, retire. Uh, Bairam Khan then plays a major role in the rest of his, uh, rest of the story because he persuades Humayu uh, to go to Iran. Uh, and the logic he used with Humayu was that he had a number of clansmen uh, in, in the Safed court in Iran. And through them, they would be able to approach the Shah, seek his help and try to make their entry back into India to regain uh, the kingdom. The next slide, please. So you have Bairam Khan taking Humayu to uh, Iran, where the Shah uh, receives them, agrees to give him some kind of assistance. Uh, Humayu spent almost a year and a half, about 15, 16 months in Iran. Uh, and we see now at this, uh, uh, in Iran, in Persia at that time, Bairam Khan's many qualities as a politician, as a diplomat. Of course, apart from the fact that he was an uh, important uh, general then in Humayu's, uh, amongst Humayu's followers in his own right. Now, the reasons how his qualities as a diplomat and as a politician comes out was because the Shah, uh, Shah Tehmas, had certain very specific requirements uh, from Humayu. And Bairam's role was to try to bridge these two different positions and bring them closer uh, together. This was the role courtiers traditionally have played, that you, you find that there is something which is in your, your, uh, in your master's and the king's interest. But how to make him bring him around to that position, uh, that is where 
your skill uh, as a courtier, as a politician, as a diplomat uh, comes in. Now, the Shah's requirements from Humayun were uh, firstly that he should uh, declare uh, his uh, personal conviction uh, in the tenets of the Shia doctrine, because uh, Tahrimus was a was a Shia. His court was dominated by uh, many Shias, uh, and the second was that the Mughal that Humayu, once he had regained part of his empire, should agree to part with uh, Kandahar. And Kandahar, as we know, for roughly two and a half centuries, was a bone of contention between the Persians and the and the Mughals uh, throughout. So. So these were the two conditions which uh, which Behram Khan uh, convinced or persuaded Humayun uh, to agree to, and Humayun may have been half convinced on his uh, own. Now, now this period is very in, uh, interesting because of uh, how Behram Khan, who was a relative nobody till Humayun enters a period of adversity after he's forced out of uh, Hindustan, how he enters a uh, a phase of his life when he becomes one of the principal nobles of the Mughal uh, Empire. With the help of uh, a Persian army, uh, Humayu then comes back, first gains victory in Kandahar, using Kandahar as a base. They then are able to capture Kabul again, finally may make their way back to India, defeat the Afghans, and he's back installed uh, as emperor uh, 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 when he dies suddenly, uh, and Behram Khan finds that he is now uh, the regent uh, to of the of the empire, with a very young uh, Akbar, uh, really too young to rule. Uh, so he needed a powerful noble to to guide him through uh, the the years, but until he became uh, mature himself. Next slide, please. Now, Bairam Khan, uh, as a regent, realized that the only way the court could be the functioning headquarters of an empire, the only way the empire could be held together or the kingdom could be consolidated, because at that time it was premature to speak of an empire. It was a fledgling kingdom being consolidated. Uh, he realized that refractory nobles, other refractory nobles had to be put down. So this particular uh, picture uh, is an arresting example of uh, an important uh, noble of the time, Shab Shah Abul Mali, who was a great favorite of Humayun, but had otherwise a sense of entitlement. And he had a sense that he should be playing a very important role, uh, notwithstanding the fact that uh, uh, the Humayun was dead. Uh, he's, uh, he had him arrested. And this is only one example. There are many others. There is the case of the execution of Tardi Beg. Khan, another very important noble of Humayu's uh, time, whom uh, Behram Khan had executed once he became uh, regent. Uh, these are all really attempts to make sure that the nobility remained united. There was no resistance uh, against uh, the, uh, uh, the king uh, and that the view of the regent uh, uh, prevailed. Now, obviously, this led to a huge amount of uh, tension uh, within that small court of the nobles as they prepared to take on the Afghans and establish themselves in uh, Delhi uh, and Agra, which were the principal capitals uh, of North India uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, there is a great deal of courtly intrigue. It has been explained in great uh, detail by a number of uh, works. But one outcome of it was that everyone except uh, agreed that they would follow Behram Khan's leadership. Behram Khan, in any ways, was reassured by uh, the harem and by Akbar's, uh, uh, the, 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 the nobles close to Akbar. Uh, and this was also done by um, uh, arranging his marriage uh, with, uh, with a lady very closely related to uh, the former king uh, Babur, Salima Sultan uh, Begum. This, this marriage reassured uh, uh, Behram Khan of his own position. He then uh, was able to finally defeat the, uh, the, the Afghans. Akbar is, uh, uh, Akbar's position becomes much more uh, secure. Next slide, please. Uh, and you find uh, Behram Khan as the regent of the empire. There's this 
I use this in the cover of my book, which is Dharam Khan overseeing Akbar learning to uh, shoot. Again, it shows uh, the size of Dharam Khan shows what an important figure uh, he was regarded as uh, at that time in uh, uh, the history of Akbar's uh, court. Next slide, please. Now, by this time, by the time uh, uh, we come to 1560, Akbar is himself now uh, a young man. And he starts resenting the fact that he has this regent who was overseeing uh, every aspect of his, uh, uh, of his life. Inevitably, as in a court, there are those who are advising him that uh, Baram Khan is getting too powerful. Uh, and a series of factors with uh, three or four important uh, 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 nobles. Uh, and some of those names are uh, important uh, because those were the ones who had closely been associated with uh, Akbar. They were his, uh, the family of his, uh, of his uh, wet nurses. Uh, they conspired uh, to, uh, they started a conspiracy against Bairam Khan. And it is inevitable in the, uh, in the ecosystem of a princely uh, or an imperial court that such conspiracies acquire a certain traction and larger than life uh, character. Uh, because of which you have Bairam Khan first rebelling against uh, Akbar, which was an ironical situation because he was the one who had consolidated the empire in so many ways. But he felt that his, his enemies were getting too close to the king. Something had to be done about it. You have him conspire. You have him rebelling against the uh, empire, is defeated. And then at the advice of the uh, emperor agrees to go on Hajj. While on the way to the Hajj, while on the way to the western coast, uh, while he had halted in Patan, he's killed uh, by a uh, Afghan. And this, uh, this particular photograph shows his uh, uh, assassination. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, before we, before I come to Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan, really, there are two or three things which are important about Bairam Khan, some of which I have already mentioned, his qualities as a general, his great personal sense of royal loyalty, that he stuck with uh, Humayun through a period when many other important nobles had deserted him as uh, someone who had no uh, prospects, but he was also in his own right uh, a well-known uh, or a, at least a connoisseur of Turkish uh, uh, poetry, and some of his uh, some of his uh, verses uh, have uh, remained, and they were collected by uh, in his Abdul Rahim uh, Khane Khanan's uh, uh, time by a compiler named uh, Nahawandi, whom Professor Razavi had referred to. And thereafter, they have survived and come up to our own times uh, uh, and have been also compiled and published uh, uh, recently. So these show him as a poet of some, uh, uh, of some uh, merit, but they also show how important uh, it was for the nobility and for the nobles and the aristocrats of that time to have these different parts to their uh, personality. That Yes, you had to be a you had to be a politician, you had to be a, uh, a distinguished uh, military man or a soldier, but you also had to have uh, other attributes. And certainly uh, poetry, calligraphy uh, were amongst those attributes, which combined to add to your personality, embellish it and establish you then, uh, established you then as a leading figure you know, of, the, of the court. Now, these qualities are important because uh, uh, we find uh, how much uh, of a role they play uh, when we study uh, Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's life, uh, uh, which I'll try to do in the next uh, few minutes. Next slide, uh, please. So Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan with his uh, mother, his mother, I should mention, is not uh, his, his biological mother is not Salima Sultan Begum, uh, the close relative of uh, Emperor Babur, whom Bairam Khan had uh, married uh, as a way of establishing his own position in the Mughal uh, court. His mother was a princess or uh, from Mewat. She was the daughter of uh, Jamal Khan Mewati, a well-known uh, local, uh, local uh, 
a state holder in Mewat at the time. Uh, he came from a family which had uh, uh, supported uh, much of the resistance against uh, uh, the nobles. They had, for instance, been part of uh, Rana Sangha's uh, army uh, when uh, that army had confronted uh, uh, Babur uh, during the initial years of the Mughal uh, Empire and so on. So Himayu had married into this family. He married one, uh, uh, there were two sisters of Jamal Khan, uh, two daughters of Jamal Khan Mewati, and Himayu married one and Bairam Khan the other. Uh, and from this marriage, uh, Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan was uh, born uh, in. Uh, uh, 1556. So he was just four or five years old uh, when his father was killed in Patan uh, en route to the Hajj. And this figure shows them being escorted back uh, to the court at the orders of Akbar. Because when he Akbar heard about uh, Bairam Khan's assassination, he immediately asked about the rest of the family and instructed that they should be brought back uh, to him. Next slide, please. Uh, the next slide uh, shows this young Abdul Rahim being presented uh, uh, to Akbar. Now, clearly, this amount of attention being paid to this young boy being brought to the court, presented to the emperor, uh, gives you a sense of the emperor's own sentiments uh, about the death of Bairam Khan, the murder of Bairam Khan, and his own sense of responsibility uh, towards his, uh, towards the family. Uh, so it's not very surprising that you find Abdul Rahim uh, Khane Khanan. Uh, at that time, he was not Khane Khanan. He was just uh, Abdul Rahim. That was the, uh, the given name as a young boy in the court, but someone on him on whom Akbar kept a close eye. It was clear to everyone, and especially to Baram Khan's former uh, enemies, that this was a boy uh, for whom the emperor felt a special uh, attachment. And you get various kinds of indications of this. Uh, firstly, from the quality of education, the quality of uh, instruction which Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan uh, received. Through the 19, uh, through the 1560s and 1570s, when he's growing up as a young uh, man, this was also the time when the Rajput alliance was being forged. Uh, and it's not surprising that you find, therefore, that we find stray references to uh, this young boy, Abdul Rahim, also having very good Sanskrit uh, teachers. And obviously, there was a certain amount of intermingling between the Rajput elements uh, and the other elements in Akbar's uh, court. There is one reference, for instance, which says that Akbar told uh, Mansing. Mansing had escorted his sister to the court and was staying with her. Uh, after she married uh, Akbar. Uh, Akbar had instructed Man Singh that please keep an eye on this boy, keep him close to you uh, at all times and look after his, uh, his instruction and his uh, education. Uh, obviously, Man Singh was a few years older than, uh, uh, than uh, Abdul Rahim. Uh, uh, next slide, please. This is a, this is a, uh, a portrait of Abdul Rahim as an old... Uh, Man, and I'll come to it later. Next slide, please. Yes, so Abdul Rahim, when he grew to uh, maturity, as I said, the 1570s, uh, this was also a time of great intellectual ferment uh, in, uh, in the court. And uh, we've all heard about the debates between the Mubarak family, uh, Fezi and Abul Fazal, uh, and Sheikh Mubarak on the one hand, and the ulema led by Sheikh Abdul uh, Nabi on the uh, on the other. So you there are numerous examples and evidences and illustrations of this young man coming to maturity at this time of intense uh, political and intellectual uh, debate. Uh, uh, now this this particular structure I found very interesting because it is. Uh, uh, a mosque established. Uh, it is. It's known as Abdul Nabi's Mosque uh, in New Delhi, uh, and it is now the headquarters. It's part of the uh, of that complex, which is the headquarters of the Jamaat Ulma uh, Islam. And uh, uh, and in this uh, uh, and in this mosque, there is a small uh, inscription uh, from 
uh, of uh, Fezi, which is which praises Abdul Nabi uh, a great deal. So in the early days, uh, Abdul Nabi was a great power uh, and uh, an enormously influential person in Akbar's court. And you had Sheikh Mubarak and his sons trying to get close to him in many ways, ingratiate themselves uh, uh, to him. Later on, of course, that situation changed because uh, uh, as Abdul Nabi became more influential, more doctrinaire, uh, that came into some kind of conflict with Akbar's own uh, views and inclinations. Uh, you have Abdul Nabi then uh, stripped of his uh, positions, sent off on the Hajj, uh, uh, and really that marked the coming uh, to age of the Akbari dispensation, which was much more eclectic, uh, uh, free thinking, uh, much more open minded uh, and something which many ulema still did not, uh, could not adjust to and did not uh, like. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, uh, so Abdul Nabi, of course, if this can be brought back a little, this is a structure in in Gujranwala in uh, Pakistan, if it could be, I don't know whether it's possible to see the whole thing. Uh, I'm sorry, the slide has got a little compressed, but this is, uh, yes, uh, this is his uh, tomb in Gujranwala in, uh, in Pakistan. It's in pretty bad shape. It was in pretty bad shape when I saw it. It's said to be his uh, uh, tomb, but again, I really put in these slides to underwrite the importance of the uh, intellectual ferment then underway uh, in, uh, in, uh, in India uh, between these conservatives and between the more liberal, eclectic, free-thinking, open-minded uh, uh, schools. Next slide, please. Now, Abdul Rahim as a young man is coming Coming, uh, uh, coming to maturity in this, uh, uh, in this uh, uh, very, very uh, intellectually stimulating environment. And not very surprisingly, you find that he is open to a large number of uh, influences. He himself shows quite early in his life signs of being uh, a polygot and someone who is familiar with uh, different uh, cultures and different forms of uh, uh, poetics. When he's still a young man, we find a work ascribed to him. This is a work of astrology called Khet Kautukam. And this is partly in Sanskrit and partly in uh, Persian. And similarly, the second work called Madanashtak, again, a great deal of Sanskrit and Persian mixed uh, verse in these uh, two works. Now, these are works of a young man and scholars who have studied them carefully point to the immaturity of uh, uh, the language and uh, so on. But it shows a certain willingness to, to venture out of a traditional uh, terrain, to try to, to, try to experiment with, uh, with language, with verse, uh, and to try to uh, bring together two uh, different uh, streams and two different uh, thought uh, processes. I think when one, I was, we've all, uh, we all know about the sad death of uh, Professor Samshur, Dr. of Samshur Rahman uh, Faruqi. But when he talks about the circumstances in which two different poetics could come together uh, in India, and because uh, his thesis was that uh, uh, Urdu uh, uh, reached deep into traditions of Sanskrit uh, poetics. Uh, as it did, it did into Persian, but the but when the two came together, they created a somewhat unique uh, blend, which is very specific to India. So I was I'm reminded a great deal of that when I look at Abdul Rahim's early works, when he's experimenting with these two radically different uh, ways of uh, uh, thinking and ways of uh, formulating and ways of uh, formulating one's uh, thoughts. So these early works, Khet Kautukam, Madan Ashtak, then there's also a work which has a certain importance in uh, early Hindi literature called Nagar Sobha, which is a, which is a series of couplets about women in uh, the court of different, uh, women's in different, women in different uh, professions. Later in his life, 
he writes something called the Naika Bhed. Now, the Naika Bhed is again an established poetical form in Sanskrit. Uh, but uh, Abdul Rahim was the first person who uh, brought, wrote a Naika Bhed uh, uh, not in Sanskrit. It had so far been a form which was limited to Sanskrit, but he brought it into Hindi or what was then uh, Hindi. So that was in some senses an uh, uh, innovation. The second innovation in this work is that Abdul Rahim uh, used a meter which was otherwise, which had not been noticed before. And this is a meter uh, in Hindi known as the Barwe. Uh, it's a very, very compressed, a very short verse. Uh, and just like, uh, 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 and just, uh, uh, just like Tulsi is said to be the master of the Chopai and Bihari the master of uh, the Doha and so on, Rahim is said to be have a complete mastery of the Barba. It's a different kind of meter. What it again shows is this person who is in the midst of this intellectual flux and is able to use and is able to navigate between different traditions uh, with some uh, with great ease. Uh, I'll come to the Dohavali later, but uh, but in the uh, around this time, and he's again still a young uh, young man, and uh, he is assigned the the task of translating Emperor Baba's work, which was in Turkish, uh, into Persian. Uh, by that time, possibly the number of people who knew Turkish, who could read uh, Chettai Turkey, uh, had become very limited. Uh, and the emperor himself may have felt that uh, he needed uh, it to be translated into Persian. And Abdul Rahim is someone who uh, attended to it and uh, uh, and was able to uh, complete it. So you find someone who uh, is familiar with Turkish, knows Persian, at the same time is deeply steeped in Sanskrit uh, poetics, is experimenting with new forms of uh, uh, of verse. So in that sense, very much of a renaissance uh, figure in Akbar's uh, uh, court. Uh, around him, therefore, he also then emerges as a patron. And you find that he is a patron. And his patronage is very well known. But he's a patron of some of the best known uh, Hindi poets of the time. Uh, Tulsi Das, people say, but it's not clearly established. But certainly the great bridge bhasha poets, Keshav Das, uh, Gang, uh, and others were very much uh, those who knew Abdul Rahim, who wrote many verses in his uh, in his uh, uh, honor. They sent him the verses, uh, and so on and so forth. Similarly, he's also a great he's also a great patron of uh, uh, of many Persian poets. And in fact, people say that uh, in his time, he was possibly the greatest patron living patron of Persian poets, even if you include uh, the royal courts uh, in India and in Persia itself. So very well-known Persian poets, Urfi, Naziri, Hayati, they were part of his uh, court. And again, you get a sense of this free-thinking, eclectic, open-minded environment because Urfi is, a, uh, is, a, is known for his verses, which are very Catholic, which is very, very... Uh, somewhat uh, liberal in their approach, if that word can be used, certainly free thinking, while Naziri is much more doctrinaire, much more uh, guided by uh, the, uh, what, what is right and what is not right according to religious doctrine. The fact that both of them are in his court suggests a certain eclectic atmosphere. He's also a great patron of uh, uh, paintings and uh, to his court are attributed some of the, the great manuscripts of uh, uh, 16th and 17th century uh, India. Unfortunately, that that great library and that great collection, of course, got dispersed. And uh, if you're not a scholar, you have to struggle to find out uh, what is Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's association with these manuscripts, because the manuscripts are known by the collection they are now part of. So therefore, a Ramayan, which was illustrated and painted and uh, uh, in his, uh, uh, under his uh, patronage and at his instructions, is known as the Freer uh, Ramayan. And similarly, a Ragmala series of paintings is known as the Lord 
Ragmala, but similarly he had similar manuscripts read of the translations of the Mahabharat, the, the Rizam Nama, the Shah Nama, the Amir Khusro's Khamsa, which is now known as the Berlin Khamsa, uh, and so on and so forth. But he was this great patron of uh, art. So you have this uh, multifaceted uh, uh, personality. Next slide, uh, uh, please. Uh, you have this multifaceted personality because alongside this great uh, uh, love of literature, this willingness to experiment, this great patron of uh, music, you also have a political and military career uh, which is progressing uh, alongside. So he, as a young boy, uh, had accompanied Gujarat, had accompanied Akbar on his uh, on a spectacular military uh, feat, which was uh, a forced march to. Uh, to Gujarat to put down a rebellion in 1573 uh, and the Delhi distance between uh, I think it was uh, Delhi and Gujarat he completed in a period of uh, two weeks a journey which normally takes uh, two or three uh, months so Abdul Rahim is part of that small contingent with the emperor as they race to Ahmedabad on camelback to put down this uh, rebellion in 1583 is appointed as governor of Gujarat in his own Right, but he's also a part of. He's also, and this is significant not so much for the historical record, but for the literary record. He's also a part of the campaign, the Mughal campaign in uh, against uh, uh, Mewar, uh, and this is of course uh, uh, a very very significant uh, event of Rajasthan history. For instance, uh, James Todd. Uh, calls the Haldighati uh, battle uh, the thermopylae of uh, medieval, uh, medieval Indian uh, history. Now, uh, as I said, Abdul Rahim's presence in this is not so much historical but literary because we, while we know he was in uh, uh, part of the Mewar campaign, possibly not for a very long time and not in any command uh, capacity, it left a huge impression on the literary. Uh, record. Uh, this very well known poet uh, Jay Shankar Prasad uh, in 1914 wrote a long poem called Mah 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 Maharana Ka Mahatva, uh, which is really about the interplay between Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan uh, and Rana Pratap and uh, Akbar. And it tells a very interesting uh, story about how Abdul Rahim's wife is uh, captured by Rana Pratap's son. Uh, or by Rana Pratap's followers. And when uh, the Rana hears about this, he orders that the woman, the women are sent back immediately uh, with full honor. Uh, and then Abdul Rahim's wife, uh, Ma Bano, uh, persuades Rahim uh, to, to, talk to, uh, to talk to the emperor to ease pressure on the Rana and says that leave him alone in his little uh, kingdom. Now, how Jay Shankar Prasad wrote about this is also an interesting story because he was basing himself on what certain Bardic chronicles in Rajasthan had written, not contemporary, not at the same time as when these events took place, some hundred years later, sometime in the 17, uh, in the 1680s, 1690s. But it is uh, this, this interplay between the Rajputs and this sense that Abdul Rahim had great sympathy for the Rajputs is something which acquired a great deal of literary weight and it continued for the next 200, 250 uh, years. Now, uh, Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan uh, in 1583 led a campaign to Gujarat and his victory there led to his being awarded formally the title of Khan -e Khanan. He thereafter was uh, uh, responsible for the conquest of Sindh in 15. 90 and then from the mid 1590s we find him in the Deccan and he spends the next quarter of a century uh, in the Deccan and the Deccan finally proved to be uh, and this is not just in this century it happens for the it this goes on for the whole of the 17th century the Mughals greatest challenge and ultimately the site of their greatest uh, failure uh, next slide please now, these are just some illustrations of the paintings, how the paintings commissioned uh, 
uh, and are part of different uh, manuscripts. This is from uh, the Freya uh, Ramayan, which was uh, uh, commissioned by Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan and uh, was a book uh, in his uh, library. It shows the wedding of the four uh, princesses. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. This is from uh, a scene from the Mahabharat the, uh, or the Rasmanama. Next, next one. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'll pause here because I spoke about this multifaceted, uh, and I'm looking now. I'm situating myself sometime uh, in uh, the 1580s, roughly around that uh, period. And I spoke about this multifaceted personality, someone who's doing very well in military and political terms, but also is this open-minded uh, individual who's writing so much Hindi, Bridge Bhasa uh, verse, a great deal of sensuous uh, poetry, Shingaras, also a certain element of devotional uh, Verses. He's commissioning works uh, uh, which are of great importance to Hindus, having them lavishly illustrated uh, and uh, uh, translated into Persian. So you get this person of a certain uh, 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 certain vintage uh, Akbari uh, noble. But I think we should nuance and qualify uh, that picture because reality was much more. Uh, complex. Uh, and uh, we get an idea of this complexity when we look at uh, Mullah Abdul Qadir uh, Badayuni's portrayal of Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan in his secret, secret history, which he wrote about Akbar's uh, court. Now, we all know that Badayuni is very, very critical of all the free thinking and the eclecticism which characterized Akbar's court. He's full of scorn. Uh, about all those who claim to be Akbar's uh, followers and uh, is generally most uncomfortable at the drift of, at the intellectual drift which uh, the Mughals have taken under uh, Akbar. But oddly enough, about Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan, he's very warm, greatly admiring. He does not see him at all as a person who's free thinking or who has abandoned any uh, doctrinaire views. In fact, he sees him as someone who stands firmly with all the pillars of uh, Islam, is very conservative, is very God-fearing, is prepared to help all of those, uh, many of those who have fallen, uh, fallen on the wrong side of the emperor's uh, pleasure because they were too orthodox or too doctrinaire uh, and so on and so forth. The other figure which uh, perhaps relates to the uh, from the 1590s onwards is Sheikh uh, Ahmad uh, Sirindi, Mujadid al fatani again very well known as a very conservative doctrinaire uh, thinker uh, later in the 19th and 20th century, uh, especially in the 20th century as the separatist uh, uh, traditions uh, gained uh, a certain uh, traction. Uh, Sirindi acquired a different uh, kind of uh, larger than life uh, uh, larger than life uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, in Pakistan, he is greatly uh, revered and elevated as one of the first, uh, one of the first uh, amongst the earliest of those who first thought of a separate homeland for Muslims, etc., etc. He was, of course, Hindi, of course, was just a Sufi thinker with certain uh, views. Uh, but his letters to Abdul Rahim again bring out a characteristic, a suggestion that uh, we need to qualify uh, this uh, portrayal of Abdul Rahim as this very, very open, liberal, uh, free thinking, someone who uh, has a great deal of uh, interest and empathy for other faiths, other cultures, because uh, from Sheikh Sarhindi's letters, you get the impression of a somewhat conservative uh, uh, thinker, someone very much like he himself. Now, uh, it is of course true, we do not have any of Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's letters to Sheikh Ahmed Sirhindi 
uh, in response. So we don't really know what he was thinking. But certainly uh, evidence such as this qualifies this picture. And because you put both these sets of, when you put both these sets of uh, views and evidences uh, together, Bada Yuni, Sheikh Ahmed Sarindi, on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's own Krishna Bhakti uh, verse, uh, his use of Hindi mythology, Hindu mythology in so much of his uh, poetry, his great patronage of many, uh, uh, many uh, Rij Bhasha poets. When you put it all together, then you get a more uh, you get a more realistic personality uh, emerging. Next slide, please. Uh, and my 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 impression after uh, on the basis of what I read uh, and what I understood was you find a figure uh, who's very much aware of the complexities of his age and of all the contradictions and tensions uh, present in his uh, times. And he's trying to navigate his way uh, through without clearly showing which camp he really belongs to. He's someone who's keeping himself open uh, so that his own career progression uh, is not affected or undermined or impacted by these intellectual debates and current uh, intellectual conflicts uh, underway uh, at, the, uh, at the time. Uh, but uh, to return to his political career, we have Abdul Rahim then in the uh, in the Deccan with Burhanpur as his uh, uh, capital. Uh, his one of his sons uh, uh, died in Burhanpur and is buried there. And there are of course a number of other structures which are associated with Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's sons. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, structure, which is the tomb of his son, Shah Nawaz Khan, again, a very important noble uh, of the second decade of the 17th century. Next slide, please. Uh, Abdul Rahim, uh, may we go back two slides. Uh, Abdul Rahim's uh, uh, career in the uh, career in the Deccan uh, really is a period of great political uh, turmoil. Uh, in different uh, ways. First of all, the Mughals were dealing with forces which were very difficult uh, for them to contain. And this is something which continues through the 17th century uh, up to the very end of Aurangzeb's uh, reign because they were really uh, addressing very, very difficult circumstances in the Deccan as they sought to establish themselves, whether to annex the kingdoms, whether to engage with the Deccan kingdoms. These are issues which dog the Mughals uh, uh, throughout and they don't never come up with a perfect answer in trying to address the problem of the resistance put up by the Deccani uh, kingdoms. Uh, they end up creating a larger than life force in the form of the Marathas, which ultimately overwhelms uh, them. So that is one aspect of Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's career in the Deccan. But the second aspect is that it's constantly buffeted by succession uh, issues because by the time he first went to the Deccan in the 16 uh, in the 1590s, you find all of Akbar's sons have grown up. Uh, they are all in their 20s: Salim, Murad, uh, Daniyal, and similarly, when he was uh, later, uh, after uh, when he was there as governor uh, of the Deccan in Jahangir's uh, time, again there is this constant succession uh, issues. And in the end, the succession issues are really what destroyed Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan and his uh, family because it came to a very tragic uh, end, uh, largely because uh, uh, you have a prince uh, in the form of Khurram or Shah Jahan rebelling against the uh, emperor. And the, all the nobles at that time forced to take sides. And Abdul Rahim is forced into this position where that he is in the Deccan, Shah Jahan rebels in the Deccan. So he is seen by the imperial court as someone who is part of uh, uh, the rebellion. And in the end, both the father and the son turn on him. His sons are executed and he himself dies uh, in uh, the mid 1620s. Uh, Next slide, please. 
so he is he is buried in a tomb which he had constructed earlier for his wife mahabano's tomb and this is uh, a photograph of the tomb before it was uh, renovated as professor rizavi uh, said next slide this is again a photograph of the older structure before renovation but this was constructed sometime in the late 1590s uh, and it the size of the building the fact that it is being constructed in the memory of a woman who is not in the royal family we have many mogul tombs but most of them are for uh, in the memory of different noble men you have very few tombs you have some for royal ladies but very few uh, tombs especially of this size and this character uh, for uh, someone who is uh, female and not in the royal uh, family this tells you something about abdur rahim khan khanans stature in the mughal uh, court next slide now i'll briefly touch on his after life because i think i've taken too long but i'll briefly run through it through the 17th century we come Uh, through the 18th century we come we, we come across brief references to abdur rahim khan khanan but they are not very significant it was it's very clear that by the early 19th or mid 19th century memory about him and his verse and his great uh, uh, poetry had faded people had forgotten about him his verses were dispersed they were uh, they were lost because many important works Uh, especially of hindi literature at the time don't really mention him you find this situation changing from the second half and especially from the 1880s 1890s uh, onwards and in my view this situation changed uh, as a quite unrelated issue gathered a great deal of momentum uh, and importance in north india which was the divide between hindi uh, and urdu uh, now the nagri pracharni sabha which was a society to establish uh, nagri and devnagri as the script as the national language of india uh, started growing in strength from the 1890s and three of its very important uh, uh, members uh, munshi devi prasad bridge ratna das maya shankar yagnik they are really responsible for Uh, collecting the corpus of rahim's uh, work putting it together uh, and publishing it uh, and uh, uh, they found a number of manuscript sources from on which basis they collected uh, uh, verses which had been lost for uh, decades if not uh, centuries and they really put together the corpus of his known uh, work and very clearly this was related to the larger exercise then underway of establishing uh, devnagri as a very old and respected uh, language of uh, and script of north uh, of north uh, india so i think the the late 19th early 20th century discovery of abdur rahim khan khanan uh, is related to that uh, process alongside that as the national movement grew in uh, strength and also as communal forces uh, uh, started acquiring a certain influence uh, especially in uh, north india you find a number of important writers and intellectuals starting to claim abdur rahim khan khanan as a kind of example or metaphor for national unity and uh, i'll mention very briefly very briefly someone called sit kovindas who was a great uh, a great supporter of the uh, hindi as the national language of india uh, movement was a congressman spent many years in jail in the 1930s and 40s he wrote a great deal about abdur rahim and he always called him as ki hamare bhartiyata ke pratik the he was a symbol of uh, indian nationalism because he was this mogul noble who had such great respect for hinduism for hindu gods and goddesses as is exemplified by in his verse and if you read his verse it is impossible to say that he was a uh, he was a muslim so he became a sense a symbol of uh, indian unity and indian nationalism next slide please 
Uh, at the same time, we have a certain a different uh, tradition, and uh, uh, which uh, and this is primarily amongst those who write in uh, in Urdu, where the fact of his enormous output in Devanagari, uh, in Bridge Bhasha, in Avdi, in Hindi, uh, is not given, uh, is not taken note of, and in fact, there is a certain sense of skepticism about whether Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan, a Mughal noble, could have actually written uh, this uh, verse. So you have, uh, for instance, the darbar e akbari this very famous book by Muhammad Hussain uh, Azad. Now, Azad is someone who is a uh, you know, great connoisseur of the Mughals. And he, he is, it's a wonderful book to read even uh, today. And one of the persons who occupies possibly almost uh, the second largest space in the whole book after Akbar himself is Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan. And if I remember correctly, Muhammad Hussain Hazad has almost 250 pages on uh, uh, on Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan and his great personality and his versatility, his qualities as a soldier, his qualities as a courtier and so on. But he doesn't say anything at all about Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's Hindi poetry. Now, it may well be it's because, because the, uh, those writing in Urdu or those who had been uh, brought up to uh, study Urdu and study Persian did not really know about what was happening in the Bridge Bhasha universe, or so many of them would not. But Muhammad Hussain Azad is intriguing because he had earlier written another very important book, which is the Abe Hayat. And Muhammad Hussain Azad knew about Bridge Bhasha and uh, Avadi, and he knew about Hindi uh, poetry. So the fact that he did not know about uh, Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan would suggest that clearly uh, uh, Rahim's memory uh, had faded a great deal in the mid 19th uh, century. Then you have Alama Shibli Nomani in the early uh, 20th century. Again, he uh, he read uh, Nahavandi's Masire Rahimi, commented on it a great deal, uh, and. Uh, uh, but and and says at one point it's it's unfortunate that we don't have examples of his Hindi uh, verse, but really it is in a follower of uh, Shibli Nomani, which is Sayyid Sabahuddin Abdul Rahman uh, in Azamgarh, uh, and he wrote a great deal about Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan in Bazm and is and and says that there's no doubt that Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan knew Hindi and wrote a great deal of Hindi verse. But whether someone who was such a good Muslim, as described by uh, by uh, Nahavandi and Baduyuni and others, could have written this kind of devotional verse in place of Krishna and Rama, uh, is it possible that this verse is not Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's and someone uh, else's? So my point simply, similarly, simply is that just like in uh, the the Nagri Pracharni movement and the growth of nationalism wants to make uh, this Mughal noble uh, into a symbol of Indian nationalism because of his great empathy with Hinduism. You have a reaction to it uh, and a skepticism whether a good Muslim could have written uh, such uh, devotional poetry uh, at all. Very clearly, these are two meta narratives or two totalizing uh, perspectives, and neither can see literary form as being uh, literary, uh, literary form and something which is important for its own sake and not uh, either belief or apost uh, apostasy. Uh, so it tells you more about the 20th century than about, uh, these views tell you more about the 20th century than about the 16th and 17th. Next slide, please. But uh, Rahim as a person who lives on and his afterlife uh, is someone uh, obviously very significant. And this mural in our parliament house, which shows Akbar and his court with Rahim, Todarmal, Abul Fazal, and many others, is an excellent example of uh, that. Next slide. Bairam Khan also has an afterlife, which is very significant. If you go to Turkmenistan, you will find many statues of Bairam Khan. Because after the breakup of the Soviet Union, when the Turkmens were looking for uh, national heroes uh, uh, deep in their history, they found Baram Khan possibly as 
uh, one of those. Uh, that history has also been very controversial uh, within Turkmenistan uh, itself over the question of whether Bairam Khan was a Shia uh, or not. Uh, uh, there was a wonderful film made about Bairam Khan in 1946, just on the eve of partition. And that gives you also a different perspective on Bairam Khan, because there you have Bairam Khan almost as a kind of proto-Akbar, advising a, uh, a Akbar on how the the empire should be administered in uh, in future. So my point simply is that when we look at Mughal history 400 years ago, we can't view it as a, a pathology sample in the lab. It's not something which has remained frozen in the uh, in the past. History, in fact, lives on uh, to our own times, and therefore the afterlife of Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, this is the plan for the renovation of uh, uh, Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's tomb, which Ratish Nanda once uh, shared with me. Next slide. So the afterlife of Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan uh, is as important as his life uh, in the 16th and 17th uh, centuries. And really, we get to uh, appreciate our own history better when we see the afterlife along with the afterlife. Uh, together. And the afterlife also enables us to understand uh, our own times uh, better than simply if we had studied it as something which had happened 400 years ago. So thank you very much, Professor Rizavi. I'm sorry I've spoken for so long, but I didn't realize I had so many slides. So thank you for giving me this opportunity to be in this uh, discussion. Thank you again. Uh, fascinating lecture, uh, sir. I mean, uh, the time passed and none of us realized that it's uh, one hour, 11 minutes, but uh, it was worth it. And uh, uh, I hope you're not tired enough not to take questions. There are a no, few no. questions. If there are questions, so, I'll be very happy. So I will uh, start uh, reading out certain of them. For example, there's a question uh by uh, Hasnan Aziz. Uh, 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 sir, can you shed some light on Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's works on astrology? Did he use Islamic paradigms in writing his works on astrology? You see, it's very clear that uh, all the Mughals gave a great deal of had a great deal of faith in astrology. Uh, now, this, this particular work, Khet Kotukam, is uh, within, uh, uh, you know, within the, uh, it's not an Islamic work, it's very much within the Hindu uh, fold and certainly uh, the Rajput influence is very uh, evident uh, in it. Uh, now, one of his early biographers, Munshi Devi Prasad, uh, spent a lot of time trying to understand Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's interest in astrology. And he went to different uh, astrologers of the time and dug out and had published in his book, it was published in 1890, published four or five different, uh, 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 different, um, you know, astrological charts about Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan uh, himself. And uh, so those were very much cast by the uh, uh, these uh, these had been cast, these horoscopes had been cast by astrologers who had accompanied the, uh, the Rajput princesses to Akbar's uh, court. Uh, and that is why they ended up in places like Ujjain uh, and uh, uh, principally in Ujjain, but one or two in smaller places in, uh, in Rajasthan. But it is certainly would have been the case also that there would have been works, uh, his horoscopes cast within the Islamic, uh, uh, from an Islamic uh, perspective uh, also. But really, I think Mughal astrology is a you know, field which I don't know very much about. So you'll have to read up on it and find out. Uh, but it's a very interesting uh, aspect of Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan's life. He himself had a great deal of faith in uh, astrology in this other uh, technique which was used a great deal called FAL, which is uh, that you try to predict what is going to happen based on which page of the Quran uh, you uh, open uh, and so on and so forth. 
Well, there is a question by uh, Khalida Zia. Uh, Khalida uh, asks a question. Uh, you know, she says that Abdul Rahim was an official historian, but I would say before uh, Raghavanji answers that Abdul Rahim was not an official historian. Uh, so, how much uh, of his history writing is applicable uh, to know about common people? during the whole period? Well, you see, his, uh, he, didn't have, he didn't write any histories, but in the poetry he wrote, uh, especially uh, the Nagar Shobha and the Naika Bhed, uh, you know, that mentions women of a large number of crafts. And certainly it gives you an insight uh, about uh, the different crafts which were there in uh, urban centers in Mughal uh, India at the uh, at the time, there are a very large number of crafts. You know, beginning with cotton carders, shield makers, uh, saddle makers. A number of them, and of course, many of them are crafts which you associate with a Mughal noble's uh, uh, personal court and uh, and household. But nevertheless, it gives you a certain insight into these different. Uh, uh, castes and occupations and trades which were there in uh, urban centers and which followed uh, in the court of uh, different and important uh, nobles of the time. Uh, I think certainly you get some insights into the common people uh, if you read his poetry uh, from that perspective. Uh, may I add something to what uh, uh, Dr. Raghavan has said? As he rightly pointed out, uh, 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 while replying uh, to you, uh, Khaled Azia, that uh, the poetry which has been left behind uh, by Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan has a lot of material which tells us about the uh, common society in which uh, you know uh, the people were existing. Apart from that, uh, you know uh, the uh, history which has been written about him, Masir Rahimi. Uh, by Nahavandi, as uh, explained by uh, Dr. Raghavan, is a crucially important source for us to understand the Mughal culture and society. As he pointed out to you while answering, that it gives you the details about the type of, you know, master craftsmen, not poets, uh, you know, uh, um, men of literature, uh, uh, ulama, scholars, and what not, and about the accomplishments and the direction uh, in which all this type of work was being given. In fact, the, the, the atelier of Abdul Rahim Khan and Khan Khanan also had information regarding the building uh, industry as well. So there are a large number of you know information which we get. Uh, by reading Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan or by the ateliers which were established by him, by the works of uh, the Havandi which has been left on uh, those aspects regarding him, as well as the poetry of Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan, uh, from which lot of information is got about the Mughal society as such. Now let me take up uh, the, uh, the, the another question uh, by Poonam Ayub. Uh, uh, Poonam Ayub uh, asks, uh, since uh, Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan grew up as an orphan in Akbar's court, was there a pointed effort to groom him in literary pursuits by Akbar himself? And who were his teachers who trained him in initial years in his learnings of various languages and later his prolific poetic works? Thank you. Thank you, Poonam. You, Poonam, I know, is in Islamabad. And thank you very much for uh, listening in and asking this uh, uh, question. Uh, uh, they're both, uh, her husband and I were colleagues uh, together. He was in the Pakistan Foreign Ministry, a very distinguished ambassador. And Poonam has spent, of course, a lot, many years in India, visited many times. I think we know a little bit about his tutors and some of the uh, certainly one or two names which I remember now 
uh, Abdul Fak Gelani was a uh, great scholar of the time in Akbar's court, and he was asked to personally tutor uh, the young boy. Um, uh, as I mentioned, many of the tutors who had traveled with Man Singh, uh, possibly Abdul Rahim had the benefit of instruction uh, from them uh, too. Uh, as I said, since his fathers came from a family which had a tradition of uh, poetry uh, writing, and his father himself was uh, known as a, a poet of some uh, standing and someone who was fond of uh, uh, poetry, uh, I think possibly that sense lived on in the young boy and made him eager to absorb uh, knowledge from all these different quarters which were present in Akbar's uh, court. You see, this, the intellectual curiosity of Abdul Rahim cannot be denied because that obviously came uh, from him. Uh, and there is evidence, I could not go into that, but of the Portuguese missionaries, for instance, encountering a young Abdul Rahim. And a number of them wrote dispatches about his curiosity, his, willing, his willingness to learn, uh, his capacity for uh, learning languages. Uh, many people, for instance, doubted whether uh, Muhammad Hussain Azad himself uh, had some doubts and so did others about whether Abdul Rahim Khane Khanan could have actually played an active role in the translation of uh, the Waqiyat e Babari from Turkish into Persian. Because the question arose that how would he have known uh, Turkish? His father had died when he was just four. Most of his father's followers would have scattered. So where did he learn his Turkish uh, from? And some people did believe that possibly he may have supervised the work in a general sense, but probably did not play an active role in it. But the English traveler visited Burhanpur when Abdul Rahim was governor of the uh, Deccan, uh, a, man a man named Hawkins. And he wrote later that he had a conversation with Abdul Rahim Khanan for about three hours and that it was conducted the, in the only common language both of them knew, which was Turkish. So clearly, Abdul Rahim had learned Turkish uh, uh, even as a young boy, possibly from some of his father's uh, uh, old retainers, but also because possibly he wanted to retain and stake a claim to his patrimony through his father. Uh, because he had lost his father so early, he grew up in a court which was increasingly dominated by uh, people from uh, Persia rather than uh, from Central Asia. Uh, possibly this staking a claim to his father's patrimony would have been important uh, to him too. Uh, well, uh, I would add to that, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Mughals themselves were Turkish speaking people. Uh, uh, Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan belonged to a family of Turkomans. Uh, they were Persians, no doubt, but Turkish speaking uh, family. Even the Mughals, uh, you know, even if you look at uh, Tuzuk e Jahangiri, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, even in the Tuzuk, when certain things are mentioned, the equivalent uh, uh, which is there in, uh, you know, Turkish is also mentioned. So Turkish was something which was, you can say, uh, uh, that it was the Madari Zuban of these people. So uh, probably Abdul Rahim uh, uh, did not have to make any efforts uh, to uh, learn this language. And uh, we are really thankful to Abdul Rahim Khanan, Khanan that he did translate uh, uh, the work uh, into Persian. And that is why, uh, you know, a number of facts uh, which Babar had mentioned in Turkish are now very, very clear to us uh, by having been translated during the same period into another language. So we know the equivalence of uh, both uh, those terms. Poonam uh, Ayub uh, is asking another question. Uh, uh, no, no, I think that is the same question which is there, uh, which he has asked. So what I am trying to say is that, uh, you know, Turkish is something which uh, probably no effort had to be made to be uh, learned by these people. It was their Madari Zaban after all. 
Now, Rana Safavi has a question. When Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan writes in Asaru Sanadid edition first, that his Bagbara was made by Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan for his wife, but usko isme rakhna naseeb nahi hua, what does it mean? I mean, uh, Sir Sayyid mentions that she was not buried there. She didn't get the opportunity to be buried there. Uh, what what I, would, I, I would think that uh, since in the second edition it doesn't mention this fact, it's possible that in the first edition uh, the uh, that his wife was not uh, buried there uh, may have been a mistake. Yeah. Uh, therefore, he corrected it in the second edition by not mentioning that. Uh, Fact, because his wife died, Mahabanu died in the late 1590s. Uh, and for the next 20 years at least, uh, Abdul Rahim Khani Khanan uh, was very much at the zenith of his uh, powers. And if he, since he had had this grand structure uh, made, and it really, you know, this having a structure made like this for your wife uh, is to make a statement. And we unfortunately don't know enough about the relationship between the husband and the wife. Uh, but certainly he is making a statement about both uh, the relationship and about his wife as a uh, person. Because it's rare to find such a structure being built by a man, as I said, outside the noble, outside the royal family. Uh, so I would imagine that she would have been buried uh, over there. Uh, I think the Mughals uh, certainly were particular about where they were. Uh, buried. The reason I showed that uh, that slide of Jamali Kamali's uh, tomb, Sheikh Gadai was close to uh, Bairam Khan. He was uh, Sheikh Jamali's son. Bairam Khan was first buried in Patan. Then his body was moved to uh, Delhi and he was buried for some time within that uh, uh, structure. Nobody quite knows where. And finally the body was moved uh, uh, to Mashhad and it was buried uh, in uh, uh, in Persia, I think they were particular about where they were, uh, where they were buried. So I would think that possibly Sir Sayyid made a error in the first edition, which he then subsequently corrected by removing that reference. Uh, you are, I think, uh, uh, Doctor Raghavan, you are quite correct there. Uh, Sir Sayyid did make a number of uh, minor mistakes uh, in his works. For example, uh, the name of uh, the mosque near Qutub Minar, uh, uh, which all the contemporary sources mention as Qubbatul Islam, is rendered as Quwwatul Islam by Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. So there are certain uh, issues and problems. So, so he might, may have uh, missed out on that. Uh, 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 as far as I am concerned, uh, I do not take Bairam Khan, especially Abdul Rahim Khan and Khanan, only as a noble. Uh, he was part family of the Mughals. And he also considered himself to be almost a Mughal, I mean, a, a belonging to the imperial family. I mean, look at the uh, extent uh, of the ateliers and uh, the works which were uh, being done by Abdul Rahim Khan uh, the, the magnitude was almost imperial. Uh, so uh, possibly, uh, I mean, that is why we uh, uh, chose this, uh, you know, topic for today's lecture, where we are we were going to talk about uh, the, the 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 imperial authority as well as aristocracy and nobility. That here is a person uh, who uh, is not a Mughal by birth, but for all practical purposes, is almost a royalty as far as the other nobles are concerned. You know, uh, uh, Dr. Raghavan started uh, uh, his uh, lecture by, uh, you know, showing us the portraits of a number of Mughal nobles, uh, both Rajput and non-Rajput, both uh, Irani and Turani and Rajputs. And uh, he talked about the fact that there is a need that some work should be done on these nobles so that we can learn much more about the Mughal society as such. Uh, the, the, the fact that Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan was worked upon is basically due to the fact that he was himself not 
only leaving behind what he had written, but uh, a work like Masira Rahimi had been compiled. And that is one of the reasons that uh, uh, such a uh, you know study could be made uh, regarding uh, Abdul Rahim Khan Khana. Uh, I would in, uh, just inform that an attempt at uh, you know studying the biographies of the Mughal nobility has been attempted. Um, you know, uh, every one of us know about uh, the, the the work of uh, Professor uh, M. Athar Ali. Uh, the dictionary of the Mughal nobility, which he has compiled, where he, he, he tries to put all the information uh, in a very uh, a dictionary form, uh, what, whatever you have to know about one particular uh, you know, noble, when he was promoted, when demoted, where he was transferred, what happened to him, who succeeded him, what were the jagis given to him, and so on and so forth. That was one level uh, of the type of work which was de- uh, done as far as a compilation of the biographies of these nobles were concerned. But apart from that, there was an American scholar, a very well-known American scholar, Wayne Begley, uh, who is much more um, better known for his work on the Taj Mahal, Taj the Illumined Tomb. I remember that he had started a work on collecting the sources of Shah Jahan's period. But along with that, you know, at one of the workshops which he conducted uh, uh, at India International Center, and he had also uh, given work to uh, some of uh, the historians, even young historians, the Taliga, Delhi, and other places. He started, you know, uh, uh, compiling the biographies of most of the important nobles and collecting even the portraits of these, uh, you know, uh, Mughal nobles. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, most of the work which he had done and which was quite substantial uh, uh, is no no more available to us. Uh, I don't know where it is. Uh, I wish that one day, because in one of the uh, workshops which he had held, he had also shown us a number of you know uh, pages of colored reproductions uh, uh, where the biographies of the nobles, along with their portraits, had been uh, you know collected by him. Uh, I wish that would come out. Uh, 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 Raghavan Sahab, uh, as you rightly pointed out, uh, that uh, uh, these works uh, should uh, be carried forward and much more information should be collected on them. Uh, one of the initial slides uh, which you showed to us is uh, pretty important. And that was the one which is there, uh, if I am not wrong, at Isfahan, that uh, one with where, uh, you know, uh, Humayun and Shah Tahmas are meeting uh, each other. And, uh, you know, I would also treat it as, uh, uh, you know, when you are dealing with uh, the afterlife of these people, I mean, I would also uh, be interested to know uh, how, uh, not only how, uh, you know, uh, the contemporary Safavids interpreted the meeting, uh, but I would also draw your attention to the fact that there are certain modern works which have been done. For example, there is a book by Manimuk Sharma on uh, Allah Hu Akbar, that uh, book on uh, Akbar the Great, where he has tried to analyze that painting and tried to show, I mean, what today we can understand from uh, such uh, representations. Uh, there is, however, one question, sir, uh, which I think you will be competent enough uh, uh, to take up, and that is, uh, as you hurriedly showed certain of the miniature paintings, uh, which are attributed to the atelier of Abdul Rahim Khan Khana. I mean, they are almost uh, imperial in uh, you know, their magnitude. Uh, my question would be, uh, not only necessarily to you, but uh, to uh, everyone uh, out there, that uh, is there any difference between how those miniatures were reproduced in the atelier of uh, Abdul Rahim Khan and Khanan and the atelier which is known as the Imperial Mughal Atelier of Akbar. Are they of the same type or is there some difference which uh, possibly, uh, naturally Raghavan Sahib is not a trained artist, uh, but I, th- my question would be to all those uh, who deal with Mughal miniatures, if uh, there is some work which could be done on this particular aspect 
uh, whether all those uh, manuscripts which were illustrated in the atelier of Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan, there were a number of works which were illustrated uh, on the orders of the Abdul Rahim. Are they uh, at par with the imperial manuscripts or not? That is one of the questions which should be taken up for some type of a study. Sir, you also pointed out uh, to one another uh, thing uh, which interested me a lot. And that was uh, the parallels which you drew uh, uh, with the information supplied by two of the very important orthodox contemporaries, Mullah Abdul Qadir Badayuni and uh, Sheikh Masir Hindi. Now, as far as Abdul Qadir Badayuni is concerned, sir, uh, you, you know, uh, he is, as you rightly pointed out, a very orthodox person. Um, you know, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the Qatay Tariq, which he gives, uh, the Hemistaish, which he gives at the, uh, 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 at the uh, occasion when some noble dies, uh, Tutami says uh, that Sag Raf, the dog has died. I mean, such things are there, especially uh, such a, uh, you know, uh, he uh, treatment is given to the uh, Non-Muslims, the Hindus and the Shias by Abdul Qadir Badayuni. Uh, so, uh, I mean, one would expect that uh, he would be critical to Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan as well. Uh, he was not very friendly or uh, with uh, Bairam Khan also. Uh, although uh, his comments about Bairam Khan are reserved and I don't think that he is very, very critical about him. Uh, but one thing, sir, which I would like to point out is that... Uh, the same uh, uh, Mullah Abdul Qadir Badaini, when he mentions, uh, you know, a person like uh, Qazi Nurla Shustari, a very well-known Shia divine. Uh, he, uh, in fact, uh, writes a whole page uh, praising uh, uh, Qazi Nurla to the sky. Uh, his knowledge of legal system, so on, this and that. He's a very upright man. But he ends one and a half page or a, or a full long paragraph on that with one sentence, Wale ke Shia but that he, that he was a Shia. So that, that was, so uh, I mean, if Mullah Abdul Qadir Badaini is giving us something, we should always take it with a pinch of salt. As far as Sir Hindi, uh, he's also uh, a character in himself. Uh, you know, two volumes of letters, Mm, writing to every important noble of the court, of Akbar's court and Jahangir's court. But as Irfan Habib uh, pointed out in his article on Sheikh Ahmad Sarindi, no reply. Mm, uh, whether those letters were written and kept in his own drawer, whether they were sent uh, to these nobles and they ignored his letters, we just don't know. So again, once uh, once again, I would say very humbly that uh, when we take uh, even the opinion of Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi regarding someone, and then secondly, sir, after being punished and put in jail, he also changes his opinion. Uh, look at the tenor of his letters in volume one and the tenor of his letters in volume two. So if uh, even Sheikh Ahmad Sarandi uh, is saying something or is not very appreciative, that might be his private opinion, uh, but uh, uh, should be no reflection uh, on the actualities. I mean, this is my, I mean, I may be totally wrong uh, there, but uh, uh, possibly it was his, their conservativeness which was coming uh, out rather than, uh, you know, any, uh, you know, problems with the personality of Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan himself. Uh, sir, I'm very thankful that uh, you uh, tried to, uh, you know, draw parallels between how Jay Shankar Prasad uh, uh, deals with uh, uh, the, 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 you know, a dialogue uh, between uh, Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan and uh, the Rana uh, and how uh, during the 20th century, the perception uh, prevailed as far as the 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 uh, afterlife of Abdul Rahim was concerned. Uh, uh, Shibli Nomani and uh, uh, 
Muhammad Hussain Azad. Uh, it is next to impossible, sir, that they would not have, in fact, uh, known uh, about the Dohas of Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan. It is next to impossible. Uh, it is not that the memory was lost during the 19th century. Uh, uh, we have enough works on the development of the Urdu language. Uh, uh, and enough people have mentioned that during the long 18th century and 19th century, we know that uh, uh, it is not that Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan had been uh, forgotten, but probably as you hinted yourself at the end of your lecture, that probably it was the skepticism on their part not to invoke that type of a concept about, you know, that is a more a reflection on the prevailing political condition. Uh, we know what, what is the time when they are writing and what type of political atmosphere is prevailing in the country. And it all led to uh, a catastrophe, which all of us know about. Uh, the division between uh, the communities, uh, the uh, this is mine, this is yours kind of a thing which developed. So I think we should take it. Uh, lastly, sir, I'm sorry, I am uh, uh, just taking too much of your time. But lastly, sir, as you pointed out, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, in one of your last slides, uh, certain of the movies where Baram Khan has been depicted, uh, the, the afterlife of Bairam Khan. You are quite correct that Bairam Khan uh, was actually spared by our Bollywood. Uh, he continued to be the good man uh, till I think the 60s. But as soon as we come to the serials of 80s, everything probably changes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, now you look at uh, Baram Khan, he is a savage, a bloodthirsty person, just the opposite of what he had been. Hmm. Serial after serial on the uh, you know television, you open and if there is a historical serial going on, something related with the Mughals, there you would see uh, the, the image of Baram Khan as an outrageous person. But again, I am thankful that somehow these characters spared Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan. Uh, and uh, I don't know whether it was a deliberate sparing or they forgot about him. Uh, but that shows how uh, we, uh, through our own political you know, uh, uh, shifts, we keep on perceiving various personalities over time. Uh, I must thank you very much once again for a remarkable, beautiful lecture which you have given. And sir, with your lecture on Abdul Rahim Khan -e Khanan, who, as I said, was not only a part of the Mughal nobility, but he was also a person who from his boyhood was brought up in the imperial harem itself. He was part of the Mughal family, part of the Akbar's household. And that was something which distinguished him. I am really thankful that uh, Abdul Rahim, there is still today, when so much has changed, when today we are baying for the blood of the Mughals, but still we are trying to conserve the tomb of Abdul Rahim Khanan in our national capital. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, dear audience, let me announce that these, uh, you know, uh, lectures, as uh, Dr. Raghavan said, would be continuing uh, in, irrespective of whether the COVID remains or goes. We would be discussing all these uh, things whenever, uh, I mean, at least uh, at the moment, uh, the, the, the series would continue. The next week, I would announce uh, the two uh, lectures which are there. One, that we would be going back uh, to Abul Fazal. I had promised last week that we would, uh, the, 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 uh, a few days back, that we would be having Professor Shirin Musvi, he would be, uh, who would be talking about Abul Fazal chronicling 
Akbar and his India. Uh, some time back, we had Professor Harbans Bukhia. He talked about the inspirations uh, which uh, uh, from where uh, Abul Fazal drew his ideas. And now we would be having a lecture on uh, 8th of January, uh, uh, where uh, Professor Shirin Musfi would be talking about chronicling Akbar and his India. On Sunday, that is 10th of January, we have another lecture, uh, which uh, you should not miss, uh, because we are not only going to uh, uh, deal with the nobility and the aristocracy, but we would also be taking up uh, the mystics and uh, you know the bhaks. And on Sunday, we have uh, Professor Linda Hess, and she is an authority on Kabir, and she would be uh, talking about the religious classes locating Kabir. So be there for both these sessions next week. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you.